Hey there, welcome. I am here today with Tamara Tarrant, and let me introduce you to her because I am really excited for this conversation because there's some really important, valuable um, things to talk about, and she's the perfect person to do it. So Tamara is a marriage and family therapist. She spent 12 years working as a court social worker, helping families in crisis. Then she quit her job or retired to run her own coaching business and still does that as well as works as a private therapist at the Wellness Center in Oxford, Connecticut. But she's also divorced and she's a mom to a 12 year old little girl and she's been divorced for five years now. And even though she's the one who wanted the divorce and even though she has a master's level education, her divorce was devastating. And now she devotes so much of her time to helping others get through their own divorce. So welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you for being so willing to talk about your story because I think a divorce makes people feel so alone. And even though we can be surrounded by friends and family, unless you are, you have gone through that yourself, you don't really get it. And the whole, point of having these conversations is hopefully to bring some light and hope to other people who are going through the same thing. So thank you for being so willing to share your story. So um, I have so many questions for you, um, but I want to start with your own personal journey because here you were a mom and a wife and you have this great job and from the outside looking in, everything would seem to be perfect but yet there were, were things happening and it wasn't. So can you share yeah. Um, what happened? Yeah, sure. So, yep, I had this wonderful job helping everybody else all day long, holding it together, trying to raise my daughter who was a little, little toddler and preschooler at the time. And um, her dad's addiction um, to alcohol just became harder and harder for me to hide. I think, you know, even being in the field, you, when you're in the midst of it, you um, push it aside and just, you know, pretend like it's not there. You just keep moving forward because, you know, for me, a marriage was what I wanted, you know, to commit to and I was no quitter and I wanted to make this work. And even if it meant, you know, um, enabling him um, as I see it now in the midst of it I didn't really see it that way I just saw it as doing what moms do which we just do everything we need to do and um, and so I worked I worked another job I you know as I was coaching at the same time I was working at the court and as a social worker and momming um, it just became more than uh, I could hide anymore and that's really what triggered for me the need to make a make a decision um, that was one of the hardest ones I've ever had to make in my life. Maybe the hardest decision I've ever had to make. And was there one particular moment that it was like a light bulb went off and said that this, this had to happen or was it a process over time? Uh, I think it was definitely a process over time. I describe it as like, as like being gently shoved repeatedly, you know, as you kind of stumble backwards towards a cliff and it's not, it's not any one like the incident, the stuff that culminated right before I finally pulled that trigger was really no different than anything else that had gone on in the 12 years before that. Um, but it was just that one last push that you were just like enough already. Um, and it was fine, you know, it, we just got to say enough's enough at some point. And, you know, even when I did say enough was enough, there was still that period of time there that I truly felt like, if he had said, okay, I'll do whatever it takes, or, you know, if there had been some kind of, there was still that, that wiggle room for me, because I didn't, I didn't want my daughter to be from a divorced family. I didn't, I didn't, I grew up with intact parents. Um, I didn't know divorce. I didn't have ever, I never walked down the aisle saying, well, if this doesn't work out. Um, and so for me, I still, even when I said, I can't do this anymore, there was still that, that glimmer of hope um, that, that resonated for probably another six months before the divorce was finalized, I think. And what was the hardest thing for you personally about your divorce? I think the hardest thing personally was realizing, um, 
that I had colluded in all of this, that my anger at him really was more anger at myself. <laughs> um, it was super easy to be really furious with him. Um, and, you know, and all of all the emotions and everything that go on with that. But as, as you process the divorce and you start to heal from um, what you're going through, if you are healing, which I think is a, is a crucial component, realizing that some of the emotion that I was throwing out at him was really some frustration that I had for myself. And then having to deal with that, I think mm -hmm. was the hardest, the hardest part of my divorce. And did you do anything in particular to help yourself heal? I got a therapist, which I, I think everyone on the planet should have, but certainly everyone going through a divorce um, needs support. And so I got my own therapist. I wish there had been a support group like the one I'm facilitating now. Um, I didn't know it that it did exist if it did. Um, so I just sought support from, and it's it, like you had said, it, friends and family are wonderful. And I definitely had that support, but I didn't have any friends who had gone through what I was going through. Um, my parents didn't, my family didn't understand, um, because they hadn't gone through the divorce, but, um, and just listening to somebody new, letting someone neutrally speak to me and just kind of say, mm -hmm you know, help wake me up out of the, um, the codependency that I had been a part of, um, it was, was incredibly invaluable. And then to be able to process through the emotions that I was going through. I tell all of my clients that they should go to therapy when they're going through a divorce, even if they've never been before, it's probably the best thing they can do to get that emotional support because Completely. their lawyers aren't therapists. And if you call your lawyer expecting that they're not going to get it or even offer any sort of valuable advice to you. And it's really the best resource. So yeah, I, I completely. Agree. So when you talk about codependency, um, is that something that you see in other marriages and people who are going through divorce as well? Absolutely. I think, you know, some aren't aware of how they've wound up where they are if they're on the receiving end of a divorce and others are, um, are think they're, they went down this path for one reason and then realize a lot as they're going through it. So I think codependency is, you know, even and especially even in the time that we're living right now, you know, alcohol and drug use is, is on the on the rise. It's a coping mechanism and you know it's becoming more and more normalized. You know, oh it's fine if you want to have a drink before your 10 o'clock conference call because everybody's working from home. Like, no, that's not okay. Um, and the more our society normalizes it, I think the more those of us who are who are functioning at a high level with, with important jobs and, you know, think that we can all hold it together. And, um, and, you know, we're not that traditional alcoholic that people think of on a bar right. stool falling down. If I just have, you know, a bottle of wine every night when my kids go to sleep to cope, like that's not, that's not a level of functioning that any of us should should be aspiring to and before people realize it's a problem it's a problem <laughs> you know usually you realize it's a problem after it's become a problem um and so the, and and or that you covered it up and i think too a lot of people who are in that situation i know myself you know if i couldn't beat them i joined them and so i started drinking more and realizing this isn't who i am this isn't who i want to be um but i thought that that was the only way i could try to connect with him and so I found myself drinking more and that, that wasn't the life I wanted to live for myself and certainly wasn't the life I wanted to live for my daughter. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Are you finding with the, the people that you're working with that um, addiction is often um, present in a marriage that's falling apart or broken? Um, I think it's a tool that people cope with, whether it's, you know, I think we all, uh, most people pick a way to cope, uh, a way to manage what their emotions are. And so some, you know, pick quote unquote healthier options like going to the gym all the time. Um, I have some of those. I, so there's, there's always a level of coping and what they choose to pick to do that with. I think alcohol is a, um, is a normal one. Food is another uh, really acceptable one. You know, it's so readily available. It's so readily accessible. Um, 
you know, spending lots and lots of time with friends and, you know, hanging out, which happens to have a lot of drinking usually along with that. So I think it's, it's really more the coping skills that people are using. Um, and then when they become maladaptive, even the gym, the gym's great too, but you don't, you don't need to be there three hours every day for sure. Right. right. So when it's addictive in just different forms. I mean, shopping, Right. I mean, exactly. You see that Absolutely. Too. Yes. Exactly. That's another I mean, great one. I'm I see. Not saying that I. <laughs> no. 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 I don't know anything about that. <laughs> the Amazon truck just pulled away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But in, in all seriousness, what is uh, enabling look like? Oh, that's such a great question. I mean, enabling is, is, is so often so subtle. It's, you know, it's the, it's the colluding, it's the accepting of something that truly in your soul you find not acceptable. And, um, and yet, you know, for me, it was taking the garbage cans down to the, to the recycle and the, and the, you know, the end of the driveway every single Sunday, because after football, he was passed out. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's accepting that I can't put a, you know, a can, a jar, can of sauce or tin from, you know, the baked beans I want to make in the recycle bin because it's full of beer cans. Um, You know, that kind of stuff where you start to say, you know, those simple, those small little things that, you know, become normalized and you just are like, well, whatever, you know, it's part of my life. Um, and that's, you know, it's the, there's small shifts. And, you know, I remember the first time I said to my therapist, we were talking and I just said something about taking the beer can out of the shower. And she was like, what? Wait, hold up. <laughs> like, can we just a- a- agree for a second that that's not normal? But like that became normal for me right, that, right. you know, if he had been working in the yard and was drinking while he was doing that and came in to take a shower, I'd take a beer into the shower with him. Like that was my normal. So your normal becomes skewed, mm-hmm. I think, for those of us who are enabling. And so we're almost not even aware that we're enabling anymore, you know, um, can be as simple as, you know, I've looked at things since we've been divorced in such a different way, but, you know, a sweatshirt that's got the, you know, the beer holder in the front of it, like, oh, that's so funny and cute. Well, not when you buy it for your husband with an alcohol problem, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's enabling, like that's, you know, that's not funny. It's not, um, it's not cool. Yes, it's worldly acceptable and that's what's happened, but, um, but that, in and of itself is enabling, you know, stopping at the liquor store to pick up their, you know, their drug of choice. Um, You know, that's that kind of stuff that can be just really subtle all the way up to, you know, hundreds of dollars were being spent at the liquor store, this liquor store, that package store, this bar. Um, When I started to tally it up, it was just out of control. So what do you tell someone who might be listening and they, hear their own story in what in your words Mm -hmm. what type of advice do you give to someone who hasn't made a decision to do anything with that and they're kind of just living in this um with the addictive whatever the addiction is you know i i tell people like if if something i i say or they've heard like stings a little bit like ooh, like ah i don't know like i tell people go in on that like find out more investigate press forward as opposed to push back if it's if it's bothering you figure out why is it bothering you like why is this why is this sticking to me um and if you know why because there's a problem it's looking for help uh, where you can get that. You know, I love that people are going to come to your podcast to hear nuggets of people's stories and, and keep finding more. You know, I just had somebody join my group last night who just was like, I'm looking for every support I can get anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that to me is wrap, wrap yourself, um, not just with friends and family, but like, you know, you got to have a tribe, you know, of things, Mm -hmm. all the books, all the podcasts, all the support, all the, you know, therapy, support group, everything you can get to kind of investigate and pull apart what it is you're, what it is you're dealing with. I think it's, I think it's super important. What does a divorce, a divorce support group offer? Because I think that's probably a new concept for a lot of people. We hear there's support groups for a lot of different things, but not necessarily divorce. 
Yeah, so the one I run is uh, faith-based, it's non-denominational, uh, but for me, my faith was gone um, in terms of dealing with, uh, with everything that was going on in my life at the time. We were so far from God, and, um, and when I got divorced or when I chose to have this divorce, I was raised Catholic, so I thought I was like the most abominable sin I could be committing at this point, and so God was going to be like super pissed at me, um, mm -hmm. is what I thought and what I felt what I was raised to kind of know for myself, and so, um, so the group that I, that I put together is definitely have that as a support piece of it, but it's really more bringing together people who are all varying stages. And some people are in, are, haven't even filed yet. Some are in the midst and the, it's not finalized. Some are two years post-divorce. Um, some with, you know, five years of marriage, 41 years of marriage. It's all over the place, but it's really bringing all of those people together right now virtually just because of where we are, um, which is also awesome because there are people from all over, all over our state that probably wouldn't come together if we were physically meeting. So, um, but really just giving them a form, um, a place to, to, to speak into each other, you know, have a conversation like you and I are having today um, and be able to listen and hear from one another their stories and heal through the process and be able to bounce things off of each other. And then there's a video component. Um, so a lot of good, um, a good quality material that can help educate. You know, our first session was really about seeing a divorce as, as you know, having visited an emergency room. Like you're, this is, this is painful. This is hard. You're undergoing a massive surgery of removal from your life. And this is, a difficult process and it's not going to you're not going to heal immediately from this this is something that is it takes as long as it takes and if you don't work through the emotions in a in a healthy way you can be two years four years ten years post divorce and still injured um, and still walking around wounded from it right and those are often the people who end up coming back to their divorce lawyer every year or so for all kinds of post-divorce stuff and conflict and modifications. Um, yeah. And usually when they do come back, there's so much anger and resentment still, and it's oh, clear yeah. that they have not healed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and, and they're going to carry that into, I, I, I think most of us want, I know I want eventually to be somebody's amazing wife. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have no intention of taking any of that going forward. Um, when I meet men who have such a, a an abominable hatred for their ex, I'm like, ding, 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 like not the person I want to join lives with. Um, you know, there's just, you know, you hope that you can put that to bed in a really healthy way. Um, I am thankful I've never, I, I said, once I dissolved this, I was never going to go back there no matter what, you know, and, and people have all their own opinions on that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, how could you let your daughter go with him? And, you know, he's an alcoholic and la, 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 la. And the truth is, is that nobody knows your story unless they're in your story. Um, right. And you make the best decisions you can with what you have. But I'll tell you, I make every effort to never return back because ultimately, the kids are the are the most important if they're in the middle of it and then secondarily ourselves and healing ourselves and making sure that we're the healthiest parent we can then be for them for sure right right and you just said so many things and i'm not even sure which way to go down first because i'm like ooh 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 i want to talk <laughs> about that too <laughs> so um the first one being so at this point in our life, we're probably going to, and anyone out there is going to date someone who has also gone down this path. And I think you raise a really good point of sort of having a, a really trusting your gut, I would think, and paying attention for the next relationship that you have. So can you speak a little bit about that and what we oh, yeah. can do to make sure we're not a statistic? Absolutely. From personal experience too, um, you know, it, it <laughs> um, you know, I, I definitely think if there's red flags, listen to them, listen to your gut. We have experience um, and we know, you, you know, we're, we're being told certain things along our way. And um, I definitely feel like, you know, looking for a partner or somebody who's, you know, if they've gone through this process, you know, I'm always, I'm always interested by those people who have never been married and have no children. That's fascinating to me. And I'm kind of curious about that. Um, and, What's wrong and, with them? 
Right. Like, what's, <laughs> that, what's up with that? Um, and not that there's anything, you know, <laughs> no. but it definitely gives me a place to look a little, little harder. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, for those of us who have been wounded, you know, we've, we've all been wounded. Everyone who's gone through a divorce has been wounded. And anyone who says um, that they were totally fine through the whole process is lying to themselves. Um, and that should be a red flag. Uh, but, but really looking at how they've processed it. And for me, um, I think anyone who has such um, animosity and vehement feelings towards someone else in a, in a really unhealthy way, then there, you know, the, the opposite of hatred isn't love. It's just apathy. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, quiet, calm. Um, it's not, it's, it's a non-emotion. It's a, it's a peacefulness really. And so I think when somebody doesn't have that towards their ex, that should be the red flag to say that they don't, they can't possibly give you all the love that you deserve. Um, if they're yeah. so emotion filled towards somebody else. So I just think that that's a huge thing for, for men and women to look at. Um, if their life is full of drama and back and forth to court and chaos, um, is that something you really want to be right. stepping into the next phase of your life with? One of the things that I absolutely love about you is your honesty and openness and authenticity. And so you and I are connected on social media and I have seen you post things about when your daughter is going away um, with her dad for a period of time and that in your feelings about that, because that's something that's really hard through divorce. I mean, I, I'm divorced too. I, I get that still. Um, it becomes less so when they become teenagers, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah the older I mean, she gets. <laughs> right. But it is a really hard feeling to sit with and you almost feel like this, this loss. So what do you say uh, about that? How do you deal with those feelings when you know it's about, you know, your own internal and it's not about them and their safety necessarily because they're, it's, yeah. they are allowed to have a relationship with their other parent. Absolutely. I think I had to learn how to be alone. Um, I think most of us who are, have been married don't have a lot of alone time. You either have your kids all the time because you're there and, and people would joke around about like, oh, I have the house to myself. And now all of a sudden you have the house to yourself maybe 50% of the time or every other weekend. And that's just weird. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say like, learn how to be alone in a really healthy space. Don't fill all your time with people and things. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to run here and I'm going to, you know, and you're, you're just filling the hole full of stuff instead of just learning how to sit with yourself and just be and learn who you are. You have the space and time to be able to do that now. Um, and so I think that's crucial. And, and again, if you're having emotions around all of this, you know, despite my husband's issues, he's also a loving father and he cares for her and he would never knowingly put her in danger. And that's what court cares about. They don't care about what you think could happen. They care right. about what would happen or who did happen. Um, and so, you know, I want her to have, she loves her dad immensely and I want nothing more than that for her. Little girls need their dads, little boys need their dads and moms. Um, because that's half of them. And I think, you know, right. kids need to know and feel your support in going and spending time with that other parent, that that child is 50% you and 50% that other mm -hmm. person. And if you're not fully supportive of that and encouraging at, at times, that was hard, <laughs> you right. know, um, to be encouraging and, 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 and push more, um, you know, when she was struggling, as most young, I mean, she was six at the time, um, do, they, they do struggle on both ways, you know, they're, they're hard to go and hard to come back. Um, right. And it's, they need their parent support and love in that. Um, so if you can just spend that, that time that you don't have them really going all in and developing yourself to be the best parent, um, the best man, the best woman, uh, the best parent you can be for them, you're going to be better for that and their kids are going to be better for that. And if you put your professional hat on when you answer this next question, um, okay. what do you see is the consequence when parents can't do exactly what you're talking about? Oh, kids are so 
so immensely impacted. You know, they are, they struggle, they, and they're not even sure why they struggle. You know, they have feelings of depression, they have increased thoughts of suicide, um, increased uh, likelihood of use of substances to numb. Um, they, they know very well that their parents don't get along and, and often hate each other. And they're, they're put in the middle, you know, look at what your mother just said to me, look at what your father did. Um, and even when parents, you know, I, I was a professional, I worked in a court going through this. There were times that I said inappropriate things like, and I've had to catch myself to be like, whoa, that was so not cool. <laughs> and I've had to go back to my kid and say, I'm sorry, like that. I should I let my own emotions get over me because I don't want her to be impacted. So I, I think when parents are unable to do that, they don't realize the deep level of impact that has on their children longstanding, no matter what age their kids are. If, you know, I think parents, some people wait till their kids are adults to get divorced as if that's going right. to make things better. Um, but their kids are still their kids, no matter what age they are. And they're still impacted by their parents, you know, 41 years of marriage dissolving. Their kids are old and have their own kids now, but they're still impacted by right. this. Um, and it's, and it, so it's incredibly detrimental on the children um, and extended families. You know, you're, you're divorcing that person, but you're also separating um, large groups of people. And, you know, ultimately, if everybody can get along for the kids and for their lives, the better off everybody would be. Right. Yeah, that's such a good point and so important. Um, how long did it take you to heal and how long do you see it takes other people? Because I think that that is often something that someone says, well, I'm being, I'm feeling in this, like I'm stuck and I'm in this muck and it's been six months and my friend is already dating and why am I still stuck? So is there a magic number to how That's long? That's such a good question. Um, my initial instinct was I'm not done. <laughs> I think I'm going to, I, I hope and I pray that I evolve every day from this point to the day, last day I, I breathe my last mm -hmm. breath. Um, so I think there'll be a continued healing. I, you know, I, I talk about it like my father died when I was 20 and I, it's similar as talking about his death. It's like, it doesn't, it's a wound that is, will always be there. There'll be a mm -hmm. scar there. Um, you're a well aware of it. It's not, it's not going to grow back. It's not going to smooth over. It's always going to be there. And, you know, if you, I have a scar on my finger, if I hit it the right way, it's like, oh, that still hurts. And that was right. 14, 15 years ago. So, so do we ever completely heal? No. Do, do we feel um, an evolved sense of self? I think absolutely. I, I tell people that the best advice I got that I didn't listen to was not to date for the first year after yeah. my divorce. Mm -hmm. um, because you're not, you, that's, you, you got an open gaping wound. Like, I don't care how long you spent separated or fighting or draw nonsense before the actual divorce date, that divorce date is like the first day of healing that can start, I truly think. And, and, you know, and there's so much that goes along with that. Everybody's story is different. How long till they had to move out or didn't move out or separate their belongings and all of those things, all of that goes into that process. And so bringing a new relationship into all of that. Right. Like, while it feels good, you know, and it's nice to be wanted by somebody else yeah. finally and, you know, all the things that I hear from people, it's, it's also could be incredibly damaging. And so I think that that's the, the advice, the best advice I didn't take. I didn't wind up marrying that man, but, and he was wonderful and taught me something. Um, but I also think that you've got to give yourself a chance to heal more. And there, I don't think that there's a perfect answer for that. I think for me, you know, two-ish years, I started to feel like, okay, I'd gone through a couple of holidays, one when I had my kid, one when I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, so you, so if you have children, like, it takes that time to kind of figure out, okay, what's Christmas Eve like when I right. don't have them, or what is it like when I do have them, um, before you go bringing anyone else into that process, I think you going through that and, and really processing it first is yeah. so important. And, and that's the best advice I didn't take either. So I share your story. And I think that it's such a common one, though. And, you know, so often just in the divorce work that I do, 
there will be someone who will start dating while the divorce is happening, or maybe they started the divorce because they met someone or they, and you know, and I always tell them and they don't ever want to hear it, that this isn't going to work. And I'm like, not to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just like warning you, just be careful because chances are this will at some point crash and burn and not to be dramatic, but it usually kind of goes up in a big way. And I think that's exactly yeah, yeah. the reason why you stated is you have not healed yourself. And, and picking someone who's the complete opposite of your spouse is not going to re resolve all of the problems that you had no. in your marriage. <laughs> so you'd think we would be wiser the second time not around, but all. I think we're a little stupider. So. <laughs> what would think, right? Yes, yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, so what is what is the final tip that you can give somebody who is really just sitting in their pain um, and what they can do today to help them start to work through it? Oh, so good. Um, just do the next best thing. Like whether that's for you, like getting up and moving your body for 30 minutes, whether it's opening up and listening to a new podcast or listening to the next chapter of a book that's going to cause healing or opening up a journal and just writing for 10 minutes, you know, just do that next best thing for you um, to, to heal, to whatever that's going to take. Stop ignoring it. Um, stop pretending it away. Stop filling all the holes. Um, just make that next best decision, not just any decision. <laughs> mm, that's great advice. Um, and also get a therapist. And yes, help. and get a therapist <laughs> if you don't have one already. <laughs> right. And if someone's listening to this and says, but I want you as my therapist, because everything that you're saying is just, it's like a gold shiny gem. Um, and there's so much truth in all of your words. How can someone connect with you and find you? Ah, they can find me at the wellnesscenter.care. Uh, that is the wellness center that I work at. So they can find me there and lots of telemedicine right now. If you're listening to this at the time, near the time we, um, so people can find me if they live in our state, they can find me, uh, low, you know, anywhere and they don't have to even travel to me. We can meet like this, uh, which is kind of unique um, and definitely not how I thought I'd be doing therapy, but it's actually mm -hmm. working fairly well and able for me to connect to people who might not be able to travel to me. Um, and if they want help in just coaching their life and not even therapy, just health and wellness and how they can make that next right step, they can find me at do it now, Tamara, T A M A R A dot com. And we will put all of those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. I love it. <laughs>